This section tests your ability to comprehend spoken English. It is divided into three parts, each with its own directions. You are not permitted to turn the page during the reading of the directions or to take notes at any time. Part A. Directions. Each item in this part consists of a brief conversation involving two speakers. Following each conversation, a third voice will ask a question. You will hear the conversations and questions only once, and they will not be written out. When you have heard each conversation and question, read the four answer choices and select the one, A, B, C, or D, that best answers the question based on what is directly stated or on what can be inferred. Then fill in the space on your answer sheet that matches the letter of the answer that you have selected. Now let's begin with the first conversation. Number one. Have you decided on your summer getaway yet? I'm reconsidering with how expensive flights have become. What does the woman imply? Number two. I went fishing by the river yesterday and now my arms are all sunburned. Next time, make sure you apply sunscreen before heading out. What can be inferred about the man? Number three. Where's Alex? He's usually the first one here. Alex is probably burning the midnight oil at the gym, as usual. What does the woman imply about Alex? Number four. I heard Mark lost his balance and fell while hiking. It's not surprising, considering he's been working on his balance sheets all week. What can be inferred about Mark? Number 5. Have you seen the latest movie that came out? Yes, I heard it's been making a lot of noise in the film industry. What does the woman mean? Number 6. Are you still thinking of going hiking this weekend? I doubt it. The weather forecast is calling for thunderstorms. What does the woman imply? Number 7. Does this subway go to the airport? No, this subway line goes to the city center. You'll need to take a different line to get to the airport. What can be inferred from this conversation? Number 8. 
I believe the new restaurant on Main Street serves the best pizza in town. Hmm, I have to disagree with you on that one. What does the woman mean? Number 9. I can't seem to figure out how to set up my new smartphone. It's so frustrating. Have you considered watching some tutorial videos online? They can be really helpful in learning how to navigate new devices. What does the man suggest the person do? Number 10. We're thinking of having a barbecue in the backyard this Saturday. Are you free to join us? That sounds like a lot of fun, but I already have plans to attend a friend's birthday party. Maybe another time. What is the woman likely to do on Saturday? Number 11. Would you like me to book a taxi for you? Thanks, but I've already arranged for a ride with my friend. What does the man mean? Number 12. I need to print out these documents before the meeting. Sure. Could you also check if the conference room is available for our discussion? What does the woman want the man to do? Number 13. Didn't Sarah say she was going to the concert tonight? Actually, she changed her plans and decided to stay home. What does the man imply about Sarah? Number 14. Wasn't David supposed to pick up the package today? No, he had it delivered to his office instead. What had the man assumed about David? Number 15. I heard Emily got a new job at the advertising agency. Hold on, that's surprising. When did her new job at the agency start? I completely missed that. What does the woman want to know? Number 16. Have you packed everything for the trip? Not yet. I still need to grab my toiletries and some snacks for the journey. What are the speakers probably getting ready for?
Number 17. Have you seen this letter from the bursar's office? Oh, no. Not another increase. If you ask me, we're already spending too much to go to school here. What are these speakers talking about? Number 18. Have you seen Tom's car? It looks like it's been in an accident. Yeah, he mentioned he got rear-ended at a traffic light. What problem did Tom encounter? Number 19. Have you had a chance to meet the CEO yet? No, she had her secretary schedule a meeting for next week. What does the woman mean? Number 20. It feels like I haven't seen Tom around in a while. Have you run into him at all by any chance? I was curious how he's doing. No, he used to work here, but he moved to a different city last month. What can we infer about Tom? Number 21. I didn't expect to see so many people at the event. Well, it's not unlikely for this event to draw a large crowd. What does the woman imply about the event? Number 22. Did you enjoy the movie last night? I didn't like the plot, and I didn't find the acting convincing either. What does the man say about the movie? Number 23. Did you manage to catch the early train? No, I barely woke up on time. I missed it by a few minutes. What does the man imply? Number 24. Did you enjoy the movie we watched last night? No other movie is more entertaining than that one. What does the man imply about the movie they watched last night? Number 25. Have you looked into booking the hotel for our trip? Not yet. I'll check the options online tonight. What does the woman say about booking the hotel?
Number 26. I can't seem to figure out how to assemble this furniture. It's so confusing. Just follow the instructions step by step and you'll be fine. What does the woman mean? Number 27. Sarah has been acting really strange lately. I heard she's been under a lot of stress at work. What can be inferred about Sarah? Number 28. Did you find out who won the competition? Yes, Sarah replaced Tom as the winner. What does the woman say about the competition? Number 29. Hey, I was wondering if Lisa ever got her car back from the repair shop. Yes, actually. They were able to fix the problem and she picked it up earlier today. What can be inferred about Lisa? Number 30. Are you planning to attend the conference next week? If I weren't so busy with work, I would definitely go. What does the woman imply about the conference? Part B. Directions. This part of the test consists of extended conversations between two speakers. After each of these conversations, there are a number of questions. You will hear each conversation and question only once, and the questions are not written out. When you have heard the questions, read the four answer choices and select the one, A, B, C, or D, that best answers the question based on what is directly stated or on what can be inferred. Then, fill in the space on your answer sheet that matches the letter of the answer that you have selected. Don't forget, during actual exams, taking notes or writing in your test book is not permitted. Now let's begin Part B with the first conversation. Questions 31 to 33. Listen to the following conversation. Hey, I just finished reading this really interesting book about the history of the Wild West. Oh cool. The Wild West is such a fascinating period. What did you find most interesting? It definitely made me realize how lawless things were back then. There wasn't much government presence in many areas, so people kind of had to make their own rules. That's true. It was kind of a boom time though, wasn't it? Lots of people were moving west looking for gold or land. Exactly. The California gold rush in the 1840s really kicked things off. Suddenly everyone had gold fever and headed west in search of riches. That sounds like a crazy time. Weren't there also a lot of famous outlaws during that period? Absolutely. Jesse James, Billy the Kid, Butch Cassidy, those names are all from the mid to late 1800s. They were definitely colorful characters, to say the least. And what about the lawmen who tried to keep things under control? Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday come to mind. Yep, 
They were around then too. The gunfight at the OK Corral in Tombstone, Arizona, happened in 1881. That's a famous showdown between cowboys and lawmen. Wow, that's so interesting to think about. It seems like such a different world back then. It definitely was. The Wild West era ended sometime around the late 1800s or early 1900s as the government expanded westward and brought more law and order to the region. I'd love to learn more about it sometime. Maybe we can watch a documentary or visit a Wild West museum one day. There are probably some great documentaries out there that explore the daily lives of people during that era, not just the outlaws. And wouldn't it be fascinating to see authentic artifacts and clothing from the Wild West in person? Sounds like a plan. We could even combine both options. First, we could watch a documentary at home to get a broad overview and then plan a trip to a Wild West museum. Imagine seeing the actual weapons used by cowboys and lawmen, or even some of the stagecoaches that carried passengers across vast stretches of land. It would be a really immersive experience. Number 31. What is the topic of the conversation? Number 32. When did the California gold rush happen that sparked interest in the Wild West? Number 33. When did the Wild West era likely come to an end? Questions 34 to 37. Listen to the following conversation. Hey David, did you hear about the new zoo that just opened on the outskirts of town? It's called Wild Haven. Well really? I hadn't heard anything about it. What kind of animals do they have there? It sounds like this new zoo has a lot of different animals to see. Based on what I read online, they have all the familiar favorites everyone loves like lions, tigers, big cuddly bears, giant elephants, and giraffes with their long necks. But that's not all. They also seem to have some special, unusual animals you don't see everywhere. For example, they have a place where you can see Komodo dragons, which are giant lizards, and even a sanctuary for sloths, those super slow-moving and kind of cute mammals. A Komodo dragon? That's awesome. Those things are fascinating creatures. And a sloth sanctuary? That sounds kind of adorable. Right. I know they also have a bunch of interactive exhibits, where you can learn more about the animals and even see some of them up close. There's supposed to be a feeding demonstration with the penguins, too. Interactive exhibits and penguin feedings? This sounds perfect for taking the kids. Have you been thinking about going? Actually, yes. I was wondering if you and the kids might be interested in checking it out with us sometime next week. It would be a fun way to spend the day and learn something new. Sounds like a fantastic idea. The kids would love to see all the animals, especially the Komodo dragon and the sloths. They've been obsessed with sloths lately after watching that documentary. Perfect. We can pack a picnic lunch and make a whole day of it. They also mentioned a splash pad for the kids to cool off in, which is a bonus on a hot summer day. Sounds like you've already done your research. I wouldn't mind seeing a Komodo dragon myself. Those things are massive lizards. Maybe we can check out the website and see what ticket options they have for families. Great idea. I bet they have some family discounts available. We can also see what time the penguin feeding demonstrations are scheduled for. That would be a highlight for sure. This sounds like a fun weekend trip for the whole family. Thanks for suggesting it, Emily. No problem, David. I think everyone will enjoy seeing all the amazing animals at Wild Haven. Number 34. What is the conversation about? Number 35. What is one of the more unusual animals the new zoo might have?
Number 36. Why might David and his family be interested in visiting the zoo? Number 37. Besides the penguin feeding demonstration, what other activity might be appealing to the children at the zoo? Now read along with the directions for Part C in your textbook as they are read to you on the tape. Part C. Directions. This part of the test consists of several talks, each given by a single speaker. After each of these talks, there are a number of questions. You will hear each talk and question only once, and the questions are not written out. When you have heard each question, read the four answer choices and select the one, A, B, C, or D, that best answers the question based on what is directly stated or on what can be inferred. Then, fill in the space on your answer sheet that matches the letter of the answer that you have selected. Questions 38 to 41. Listen to a part of a lecture about a type of dance. Hola everyone and welcome back to our exploration of world dance styles. Today, we'll be delving into the passionate and fiery world of flamenco, a traditional dance form originating in Andalusia, Spain. Flamenco is much more than just a dance, it's a captivating art form that combines rhythmic footwork, expressive body movements, and powerful music. Now, when you picture flamenco, you might imagine a woman in a flowing red dress, clicking her castanets and performing intricate footwork. While this image is certainly part of flamenco, it only represents one aspect of this multifaceted dance. Traditionally, flamenco was a social dance performed by both men and women, often in intimate gatherings or celebrations. The dancers would improvise steps and movements based on the rhythm of the music, expressing a range of emotions from joy and celebration to sorrow and defiance. Flamenco music is as crucial as the dance itself. It typically features the soulful sounds of a flamenco guitar, the rhythmic accompaniment of palmas, hand clapping, and cajon, a box drum, and sometimes the haunting melodies of a flamenco singer. The lyrics of the songs often tell stories of love, loss, and the struggles of everyday life. Over the years, flamenco has evolved and diversified. Today, there are various styles of flamenco, each with its own unique characteristics and regional influences. You might encounter flamenco performances that are more theatrical, featuring elaborate costumes and choreography. Other styles retain the essence of the improvised, spontaneous dance form. So, the next time you hear the captivating sounds of flamenco music, remember that it's not just music, it's a window into a rich cultural heritage filled with passion, emotion, and storytelling through movement. Number 38. What is the main topic of the lecture? Number 39. What is a misconception about traditional flamenco dance? Number 40. What are some key elements of flamenco music? Number 41. What does the speaker suggest about the evolution of flamenco? Questions 42 to 45. 
Listen to the following talk about a natural phenomenon. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's presentation on the breathtaking phenomenon known as the Aurora Borealis or the Northern Lights. Have you ever dreamt of witnessing a dazzling display of vibrant colors dancing across the night sky? The Northern Lights are a truly awe inspiring natural spectacle that has captivated people for centuries. These mesmerizing lights are not just a pretty sight. They are the result of a fascinating scientific process. When charged particles from the sun, called solar wind, collide with the Earth's atmosphere, they interact with the gases present there, primarily oxygen and nitrogen. This interaction excites the atoms and molecules in these gases, causing them to emit light. The color of the aurora depends on which gas is being excited. Oxygen typically produces green and red hues, while nitrogen emits a blue or violet color. The intensity and location of the northern lights are influenced by several factors. Stronger solar flares, which are bursts of energy from the sun, can lead to more impressive displays. The Earth's magnetic field also plays a crucial role, channeling the charged particles towards the poles. This is why the northern lights are primarily visible in high-latitude regions like Alaska, Canada, Iceland, and Norway. While the science behind the northern lights is fascinating, the cultural significance of this phenomenon is equally captivating. Many cultures have woven stories and legends around the aurora, attributing them to divine intervention, spirits dancing in the sky, or messages from the ancestors. For some, witnessing the northern lights is considered a sign of good luck or a powerful spiritual experience. If you ever have the opportunity to chase the northern lights, be sure to plan your trip carefully. Look for locations with minimal light pollution, as darkness enhances the visibility of the aurora. Dress warmly, as these areas tend to be quite cold, especially during winter months. And most importantly, be patient and keep your eyes peeled towards the night sky. With a little planning and a dash of luck, you might just witness a breathtaking display of the northern lights, a natural wonder that will leave you speechless. Number 42. What is the main topic of the lecture? Number 43. What scientific process causes the northern lights? Number 44. What factors influence the intensity of the northern lights? Number 45. Why are the northern lights primarily visible in high latitude regions? Questions 46 to 50. Listen to part of a lecture about the wonderful world of vegetable gardening. Now, in the last few minutes of class, I'd like to address a slightly different issue, the question of how to cultivate a vegetable garden. For many people, the idea of nurturing life and enjoying fresh, homegrown vegetables is incredibly appealing, but it can seem daunting at first. Don't worry though. With a little planning and some basic knowledge, you can be harvesting delicious, healthy produce right from your own backyard. Like us humans, vegetables need a comfortable environment to thrive. Look for a sunny spot in your yard that gets at least 6 to 8 hours of direct sunlight each day. Easy access to water is also important, so keep that in mind when choosing your location. Healthy soil is the foundation of a thriving vegetable garden. Ideally, your soil should be loose and well-draining, allowing water to reach the roots without causing them to rot. If your soil is compacted clay, adding organic matter like compost or aged manure can help improve its drainage and fertility. Once you've chosen your location and prepped your soil, it's time for the fun part planting. 
Research different vegetables that grow well in your climate and planting zone. Deciding what to plant can be exciting, but be sure to consider factors like sunlight needs, spacing requirements, and your own personal preferences. Just like thirsty humans need a drink, your vegetables need regular watering to stay happy and healthy. The frequency and amount of water will vary depending on the type of vegetable, the weather conditions, and the stage of growth. Generally, it's better to water deeply and less frequently than to give your plants a shallow sprinkle every day. Your vegetable garden won't run itself. Throughout the growing season, you'll need to tend to your plants by weeding, removing pests, and providing support for climbing vegetables like tomatoes or beans. Number 46. What is the main topic of this lecture? Number 47. What is an important factor to consider when choosing a location for your vegetable garden? Number 48. What is the benefit of adding organic matter like compost to your soil? Number 49. How often should you water your vegetable garden? Number 50. What is one way to take care of your vegetable garden throughout the year? 